We have an active shooter. We have an active shooter inside the warehouse. Welcome to Active Shooter, a podcast that covers the whys, the hows, and the aftermath of active shooter and mass casualty events. They have an active shooter in the building. A second call says they uh, are being attacked. I've been shot. <laughs> One six nine ten means we got shots fired. Four fifteen a.m. at the Route two ninety one. Sounded like an automatic firearm. Active shooter, reports of an active shooter, active shooter, active shooter of mass casualty incidents. Thank you for listening. You are listening to Active Shooter, a podcast that may contain adult themes, explicit language, and graphic depictions of violence. Portions of this show may be traumatic for those under 18. Listener discretion is advised. We have breaking news about that deadly mass shooting in a Southern California bar and country music venue. The Ventura County Sheriff says a gunman opened fire inside as it was crowded with more than 100 people, many of them college students. He killed 12 people, including a sheriff sergeant who was responding to the scene. Police found the shooter dead inside, and they reportedly have identified him. There's been a lot of debate recently about the use of cell phone applications to locate your friends and family and see where they are and at what time. Teenagers enjoy seeing where their friends are and what they are doing, while parents seem to loathe these apps due to their child's location being visible to everyone, sometimes including strangers. However, when correctly utilized, they can come in handy in emergency situations, say, if you're lost in the woods. Applications such as Find My Friends, Snapchat, and Life360 use your cell phone's GPS to locate where you are, and then displays it for others to see. In today's episode, we will discuss how friends and families utilize these apps to know whether their loved ones were dead or alive. Active Shooter, the podcast, is a High Five Holly production, and I'm your host, JT. If you've listened to our prior episodes, you know that the Active Shooter podcast team has taken the No Notoriety Pledge, and we will not be sharing the real name of the shooters that we cover. We will be giving the shooters a pseudonym and refer to them by that name throughout the episode. This will help in clearing up any confusion in the story while remaining true to our pledge and not naming the shooter by their actual name. In today's episode, we will be referring to the shooter as Brandon. On Wednesday, November 7th, 2018, at around 11.20 p.m., over 200 college-age students filled the dance hall of a popular country-line dancing nightclub called Borderline Bar & Grill, located in Thousand Oaks, California. Brandon, a 28-year-old Marine Corps veteran, had parked his car and started to make his way towards the popular country western bar. He was armed with a 45 Glock 21 semi-automatic pistol, complete with a laser sight. He also had seven high-capacity magazines, each magazine being able to hold 30 rounds. Brandon was dressed all in black, heavily tattooed, with sunglasses on and a bandana covering his face. As he approached the bar, he noticed a bouncer outside the entrance. As Brandon neared, he shot the bouncer, killing him instantly. Brandon then made his way inside. When he entered the front doors, there was a young lady named Christina standing behind the counter. Christina worked as a cashier at the bar. Without giving it a second thought, Brandon raised his firearm and shot Christina, also killing her instantly. After shooting and killing Christina, Brandon turned right and made his way through the bar and opened fire all while, shockingly, posting to social media. Brandon had posted two social media posts while committing the shooting. I hope people call me insane. 
Yeah, I'm insane, but the only thing you people do after these shootings is hopes and prayers and wonder why these keep happening. Brandon also threw smoke bombs into the crowds that created thick, heavy smoke throughout the bar and dance area. The patrons were confused, not sure what was going on. One witness commented that she thought the balloons were popping. It never occurred to her that they were under fire. As soon as people saw bodies falling and bullets spraying, they quickly figured out that there was an active shooter in the bar. Chaos quickly ensued as people started running for their lives. While some patrons were able to escape out a side exit, others weren't so lucky. A handful of people had thrown bar stools at a window in order to smash the window so they could escape to freedom. Friends got the bar stools and they started slamming it against the window so we could get out. (laughs) Others hid under bar furniture, pool tables, bathrooms, and even in crawl spaces in the attic. Listeners, the following clip contains the sound of gunshots and may be triggering for some people. If you're not comfortable hearing this audio, please skip forward 40 seconds. Sergeant Ron Hillis was on the phone with his wife when he heard the call of shots fired over his police radio. He told his wife he loved her, and he had to go. After hanging up the phone, Sergeant Hillis, as well as a California Highway Patrol officer, made their way towards the Borderline Bar and Grill. As soon as they heard shots being fired, they entered the building without giving it a second thought. Sergeant Hillis and the patrol officer entered and immediately exchanged gunfire with Brandon. While Brandon was being shot at, he put the gun to his head and pulled the trigger, killing himself instantly. Tragically, Sergeant Ron Hillis wouldn't survive the gunfight. He was shot five times by the shooter, and once, on accident, by the highway patrol officer. But Sergeant Hillis died a hero. There are multiple shots being fired in the back, northwest area. We got multiple people down. We need a lot of ambulance. We have one victim who was shot and bleeding at the entrance. As additional police, fire departments, and ambulances arrived, the panic didn't immediately cease. Due to the amount of smoke from the smoke bombs and gunfire, screams, and blood everywhere, It was near impossible to tell that the shooter had committed suicide. His body would later be found in the kitchen office area. Officers started escorting large groups of people to safety and evacuating the people who were still inside the building cowering with fear. At least five off-duty police officers had heard of the attack and responded to the scene to see what they could do to help. Brandon had fired for almost three full minutes. Witnesses, however, would later say it felt like much, much longer. Brandon had killed 12 people in total. All the victims were shot at close range and died quickly. One victim suffered bullet wounds and was also stabbed in the neck by Brandon. I heard the gunshot. I turned around and I saw him shoot a couple more times. And within a split second, everyone yelled, get down. So I ran to the left of the dance floor where the back door is, and everyone pretty much dogpiled on top of each other. And then um, it was silent for a couple seconds, and then all of a sudden, a couple guys that were closer to the bar, uh, they got up and started running towards the back door and said, get up, he's coming. And so... Um, it was huge panic. Everyone tried getting up and then um, strampled a couple times. Some guy came behind me, lifted me up and said, let's go. 
Um, and then I got a bar stool thrown at my head because they were trying to break the window to get out. A total of 128 people were injured. One was injured by gunfire. Four victims had fractured bones and dislocated joints. Thirteen victims needed stitches. And 110 victims had bumps, scrapes, bruises, or complained of pain. The amount of psychological damage that was done was impossible to quantify. A family reunification center was set up at the Thousand Oaks Teen Center, as well as a base of operations in a parking lot of a shopping center located just a few blocks away. Friends and families flocked to the reunification center in hopes that their loved ones would be there. Not everyone would be so lucky, however. As mentioned in the beginning of this episode, many people utilized different apps where a person could see where someone else was by using the GPS coordinates on that person's phone. Jason Kaufman, one of the victim's fathers, used his son's tracking app to locate his son. The app showed that his son was at the bar, and that his location was not moving. This confirmed Jason's worst nightmare. His son was inside the bar, dead. As stated earlier, there is a lot of controversy with the use of tracking apps. Some parents love the fact that they can track their children and see where they are, while it instills fear in others that strangers may be able to track their child. There is no right answer if tracking apps are good or bad, and it seems that this is just the beginning, as technology is ever-evolving. Police concluded their investigation, including conducting over 400 interviews with witnesses, family members, and police. Hours of surveillance footage also had to be reviewed as well as over 85 911 calls. Five of the seven high-capacity magazines were recovered fully loaded. These high-capacity magazines are banned in the state of California, and it is unknown where exactly Brandon purchased them. Investigators did find out that the gun used in the slaying was bought at a Southern California gun shop. Officers also secured search warrants for Brandon's home, where he lived with his mom, as well as Brandon's vehicle. No other weapons were found. 54-year-old Sergeant Ron Hillis was a 29-year veteran of the Ventura County Sheriff's Office. He was hoping to retire within the next year or so, a milestone that was tragically taken from him. Sergeant Hillis enjoyed camping and going on fishing trips, especially with his son Jordan and wife Karen. In addition to working for the Ventura County Sheriff's Office, Sergeant Hillis also had his own business teaching gun safety to individuals who were interested in getting their concealed weapons permit. He had gotten his master's degree in administrative leadership from the University of Oklahoma. Sergeant Helis risked his life to save many, many others. His strength and heroism will never be forgotten. Noelle Sparks was 21 years old, and excelled as a dancer and an artist. Noelle was also a member of the United Methodist Church Westlake Village. Dan Manrique was 33 years old and a Marine Corps veteran. He dedicated his life to helping and serving others. Justin Meek was 23 years old and a recent graduate from California Lutheran University. He worked at the Veterans Resource Office and was planning on joining the U.S. Coast Guard. Cody Kaufman, whose father was mentioned earlier, had just celebrated his 22nd birthday. He was thinking about joining the Army. Cody was also the head umpire for a local baseball league, something he was very passionate about. Elena Housley was an 18-year-old student at Pepperdine University. Her aunt is actress Tamara Mowry Housley. Elena's aunt and uncle took to social media to ask for thoughts, prayers, and support during this troubling time. Telemachus Orfanos, or Tell, was 27 years old. Tell had survived the Route 91 music festival shooting in Las Vegas. However, he wouldn't survive the shooting that occurred at the Thousand Oaks Bar and Grill. Tell's mom made a statement stating she doesn't want thoughts. She doesn't want prayers. She only wants gun control. The bouncer for the Borderline Bar and Grill, Sean Adler, was 48 years old. He was the former strength coach at Royal High School for their wrestling team. Mark Maitza Jr. would have celebrated his 21st birthday on November 19th. 